having done a little talk on rational atheism, it's only fair that I flip the story and do one on rational Christianity. What I'm trying to do is go pro, then con, then pro, then con on both sides of the issue. It's better to do it that way because then each side gets to have its own presentation and it's easier to compare. The typical analysis that gets done conflates both sides going pro and con in one like discussion. And as a result, there's a sort of mass of confusion. So that's why, like in a trial, jury trial, you have first the prosecution's presentation of the case. And then you have the defense. So that each side got to have a, an unbroken amount of time even though there's cross-examination. Each side got to have an unbroken amount of its own time so that a jury can consider one side, even including cross-examination, in a context, a whole context. So that's what I'm trying to do here. I just finished saying in rational atheism, leaving it with four immaterialities, that the rational atheist has historically and even currently, represented by Dr. Berlinski, the atheist has, who is rational will admit. It doesn't mean that he believes in God, but he admits that these problems remain. And pending the answers to these problems, maybe he will believe in God, maybe he won't. So, in the interim, there's like this sort of no-man's land. How do you go about proving something that's invisible, having its own existence? Because like Berlinski was saying, you basically got God, logic, and nothing as your answer to those immaterialities, and all of those answers are inadequate. That's his word for it, inadequate. I want to say that's on page 34 of his book, but I showed it in the video. God, logic, or nothing to explain the four immaterialities. Of course, if it's God, as Berlinski was saying, which version of God are we talking about? Are we talking about a version of God that's more traditional, where God has the say over everything else? And then in Berlinski's mind, the problem was, well, what if this God is capricious and changes his mind about what good and bad is? And in Berlinski's book, he uses the example of rape. Today, rape is outlawed. Okay, but what if tomorrow God decided rape was a good idea? Would we go along with that because, after all, it's God's will and we won't know any better? Or will we determine that God is repugnant and to hell with him? That's basically how Berlinski ended the, the argument, to hell with him. Well, that's, that's a definite question. Okay, so rational Christianity, therefore, would have to deal with that question. And in fact, it has been historically in Christianity. You know, I covered historically in atheism, now we're talking historically in Christianity. Rational Christians have been dealing with that argument and question for a very long time. I mean, it goes all the way back to, you know, Moses' day. A lot of the arguments in the Bible are about this. Um, but in, like, the Church Fathers, particularly in, in Irenaeus and Augustine, Augustine even wrote the treatise on the will, as a, you know, to ferret out this question, why does evil exist? 
Because to say that God authored evil, even though the Bible actually does say that, in Isaiah 45, 7, actually the verse means God created the evil one. God is taking responsibility for having created freedom, and he knew when he created Satan what was going to come out, and he could have stopped it, but did not. That's a genuine conundrum for the Christian to deal with. God can stop evil at any time. Why doesn't he do so? And a rational atheist, Berlinski in this case, but you can hear it in many voices, says, you know, excuse me. Okay, fine. I can't explain these immaterialities. I don't know how the universe got here. But please don't expect me to just cave in to the God of the Bible because he doesn't sound like a very nice person. If there's a God... Uh, I don't think he's the one. And you can understand why atheists would say that. So the rational Christian does have to answer that question, and it's the toughest question to answer of all of them. I mean, because, you know, the so-called thing about Bible contradictions, that's easily resolved. The so-called thing about the Bible being historically inaccurate or biologically inaccurate or scientifically inaccurate, all those things are false claims that are easily proven false. But you can't say that God didn't author and that he can't prevent evil. If he's God, he can prevent or do anything he wants. And a rational Christian can't skirt that issue. Now, it turns out that God's basically begging the question. He wants us to consider this issue. He makes a big stink about it, like in Isaiah 45, 7, where he takes responsibility for it. That's what the cross is about. And his answer is he wants truth to be free. And the part about it that I find the hardest to deal with is he not only wants truth to be free, but he sacrifices himself to it. Now this is where Berlinski was getting back into. Is God really sovereign over everything? Or is he rather just, a, as, as Berlinski puts it, a constable? That the truth and good and bad are all really higher than God, and he's just like in charge of policing it. Which is, as Berlinski was writing, that would be a very comfortable conclusion for an atheist because then there's something higher than God. So even though God is named God, he's really not God because the thing that's higher than him is really, you know, Lord overall. And God would just be a constable, in which case, no problem. Okay. the issue that the rational Christian has to resolve then and it's been a big debate for centuries which is true is God merely a constable and good, right, true is truth, rightness justice good, bad is that all actually superior to God and God defers to it or is he really sovereign and therefore if he decreed a square be a circle or a circle be a square, that's what it would be. Now the Calvinists in particular have been arguing about this, but the other church fathers had also before them. The Calvinists trump the idea that God is sovereign, but at the same time, they want to be able to say that there is inherent in God's own nature attributes of truth and righteousness and justice and in their words God is constrained to obey those things that's not sovereignty sorry my number one argument against Calvinism is this one they claim they mouth God sovereign grace sovereign grace and then they take it away in the fine print that's why, to me, Calvinism is almost as apostate as Catholicism, as King James-onlyism. King James-onlyism is the worst. 
even when the King James people mouth the right doctrines, as they frequently do, they undercut and gut out everything that they say by saying that the Bible we have is not the true Bible, but instead some invention of a bunch of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants in 1611. So God was incompetent until 1611? Well, then their doctrines, which are all based on the original languages, not on the English, all their doctrines then are invalidated. So they undercut their own argument. The Catholics undercut their own argument because they basically argue at cross purposes too. On the one hand, God is grace, but on the other hand, you got to do all these good deeds. And by the way, you can lose your salvation. Okay? Um, depends on the version of Catholicism, whether or not you can lose it. Uh, and Calvinists say you can't lose your salvation, but maybe you were never really saved in the first place unless you did good deeds. And then, of course, the Lordship Salvation Heresy is... Uh, contrary to classic Calvinism and is a sub part of current Calvinism. But ever since Calvin, Calvin was always confused about this. The sovereignty of God, he's either sovereign or he's not. Omnipotence means omnipotence. If he's omnipotence, then he's wholly sovereign. And he's not omnipotent if he can't change his attributes. He's not omnipotent if he can't on a whim whether it was right or wrong, change his mind. He's not omnipotent if he can't sin. So a truly sovereign God, which means he's either God or not, a truly sovereign God can indeed sin, change his mind, make a square circle. Today rape is wrong and tomorrow it's okay. Otherwise, he's really not God. Maybe a super creature or a constable like Berlinski was positing. Because that was a troubling thing for Berlinski. That's one of the reasons it sounds like. It's one of the reasons he doesn't believe. Either God is capricious because he's sovereign and he can therefore be capricious. And so Berlinski's argument is what guarantee do we have that he won't be? And then the other argument is, well, he's just a constable. And that's troubling to Berlinski also because then, of course, he's not really God. What's the point of God? He'd be irrelevant, and that was what Berlinski was arguing. Okay, so the rational Christian has to deal with these issues. And like I said, it's been discussed almost ad nauseum for 2,000 years. Which, how do we resolve this? The Calvin is finally trying to sort of shoehorn the constable problem into saying, well, God's got his own attributes. These are actually, it is actually God's own nature to be true and righteous and just, and that these attributes control how he uses his will. That's the ultimate, how, how, how do you want to put it? That's the ultimate blasphemy against God as far as I'm concerned. But it to the, uh, the non-thinker, the person who can't discern, that would nicely answer Berlinski. Well, yeah, uh, God's not really a constable because he's sovereign, but by happenstance, his attributes are basically, um, let's, let's put it, um, that they determine his will. So it's like saying that there's this guarantee that God won't be a bad boy. Now, I'm sorry, but that's a betrayal of omnipotent sovereignty and especially God's own nature. It actually would make God a slave of his attributes. I would rather have a Richard Dawkins who says that God, God is only God if he's beneath nature and therefore not really God. Nature would be God instead than the Calvinist position, which pretends to laud God and actually, you know, stamps him in the dust. So the rational Christian is going to have to get rid of the constable idea. It's going to have to get rid of the shackled sovereignty idea sold by Calvinism. 
I'm not sure how much it sold in Catholicism. Catholicism's really big on free will, and rightly so. But Catholicism sort of attributes a kind of merit to free will. Because that was Augustine's big failing, who couldn't argue his way out of a paper bag in his treatise on free will. It's one of the stupidest books I've ever written, read, rather. Augustine basically saying, well, because man has free will and he can choose what is good, then man is really good. No. If you can choose what is good, it's because the thing that you choose is good and you actually had accurate information to make the choice. It's not your merit, it's the object that's got the merit. Duh. Calvin screwed up on that too. Okay, so you got to jettison the idea that free will has merit. You got to jettison the idea that God is constrained by his attributes, if you're going to be a rational Christian. You got to jettison the idea that if you make a good choice, somehow you're good. That's straight from the sin nature, which always tries to take credit for itself for everything that is good. And you're going to have to say, okay, as a rational Christian, how do I answer? the very valid points that a, a rational atheist like Berlinski would make. Hello, um, the God of the Bible doesn't seem too moral. And even if all my objections to what seems to be immorality of God in the Old Testament are answered and I'm, you know, proven inaccurate there, um, God has the right to change his mind tomorrow if he's sovereign. And why would I want to believe in a God who might change his mind? You see? That's a real important point for the rational Christian to address. So how does the rational Christian address it? Well, to me, the answer is really simple. No offense. God doesn't need your help. God doesn't need anything you can do. God is not going to be improved, helped, encouraged, or benefited by anything you can do at all. And if he's God, he's omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, omni everything. And he knew the minute he created your soul at birth, pattern of Genesis 2-7, the real you is your soul, not your body. He knew going in, when he created your soul, everything you would ever think and do, all the stupid things, all the bad things, all the horror things. I mean, he gave a soul that, that became a Hitler. He knew all that going in. So, there is nothing you can do that will surprise him, upset him, improve on him, benefit him, or anything else. So he certainly doesn't need religion, and he doesn't need you to worship him, and he doesn't need you to do good deeds. He doesn't need anything from you. At which point the atheist is going to say two things. First, well, if he knew Hitler was going to result when he imputed the soul to the, you know, body that became Hitler's, then God is guilty of. Because he could have stopped it. Fair enough. I mean, because that, 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 there's no getting around that argument. It's true. Second argument that the atheist can make is why then would God do this to himself? That's an even more pow powerful argument. I mean, do you go to the store and buy something that is totally useless to you? I mean, totally useless. It can't do anything for you. It ha there's nothing pleasing about it. I mean, let's say, let's say, would you go to the nursery 
and I mean the gardening nursery, buy 20 pounds of manure, fresh, smelly, and put it on your bed. That not only wouldn't do anything for you, that would be an annoyance. And leave it on your bed. So now you got bugs, the smell is awful, it taints everything in the house. I mean, I don't know if you're aware of it. It happened to me, so that's kind of how I know. If you had a sewer line underneath your house and it backed up, it would infect, the smell would get into absolutely everything in your house. That happened to me. I had to have everything either thrown away, burnt, or cleaned. And even for months after that, the smell didn't completely go away. It's not like, even if the, the stuff in the sewer underneath the house doesn't actually touch anything in the house, the fumes get into everything. Well, if you bought 20, 30, 50 pounds of manure, dumped it on your bed, and just left it there to ripen in the heat, didn't turn on your air conditioner, you'd have bugs of every kind all over your house, and the smell would get into everything. Would you willingly go buy manure to do that with it? And, of course, the sensible answer is no. But that's essentially what God did in creating he saddled himself with us now the next logical conclusion and this is something Berlinski didn't bring up but I'm sure somebody will have thought of it maybe he did just didn't bring it up there then then is this God really sane is he a masochist or a sadist or both because he could have avoided creating the manure in the first place, namely us. Or he could have created us differently so he wouldn't be so stinky. But he didn't do that either. See, which it, it's turning on God's own character, you notice? The, the shallow arguments that atheists come up with or basically, well, God was a murderer in the Old Testament. That's not really true. And after a few, if you can get them to pay attention long enough, after a few walks through the Old Testament and some historical data on the people involved, uh, you know, you can pretty much dispel their arguments quickly. Oh, God hates homosexuals. Oh, God does this. Oh, God does, you know, blah, 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 blah. Those are all shallow arguments. The deeper argument is, why would he create beings knowing in advance what they would do wrong and they get to live? And deeper still, why would he create beings so inferior that they stink? And the Bible actually says this. I'm not making up this, this analogy to, to manure, you know, out of thin air. I'm thinking of Philippians 3.8 and I'm thinking of Isaiah 64.6. 6. Both of which use pretty graphic terms to say that man stinks. Once you know what true righteousness is, you can't stand yourself. Fortunately, most of the human race has no idea what true righteousness is. And when you find out, you can't live with yourself or anything else anymore. It's just a torture just to be alive. The atheist actually has some idea of that. The smarter ones, the rational ones. And the highest argument you can make against God's existence is why would he do this to himself? The rational Christian has to deal with that. And I've been trying in my Sad Strat series to deal with that. I, I'm still upset about it too. 
God wants truth be free, and He wants it at any cost. And he doesn't care how hard He has, to, how hard it and bad it makes it for Himself. So, uh, Psalm 138 two. He puts truth above His own name, and that sounds like a constable role that Berlinski was talking about. But actually, truth is something God creates ex nihilo. It's his attribute to create it out of or disregard it. And he does, he chooses truth to be free. Of course, now we're talking finite truth rather than infinite. And that's how he chooses it to be, no matter what it costs. No matter what it costs him and no matter what it costs us. And that's where the idea that God is a sadist genuinely comes in. Rational Christian has to learn to deal with that, and everybody who loses his faith in God, this is why. At some point in the life, the Christian comes to see God, either either God cannot exist, or the unfairness that the Christian is suddenly aware of makes God look like a monster. You know, usually this kind of loss of faith happens when you get sick, or someone close to you gets sick, or a loved one is hurt, or, you know, there's some crime, or something goes really wrong, personally. Or you can look at big events like the Holocaust. That's a popular reason to say no God exists. Because if something that unjust occurs, then either there is no God or He doesn't care. And if he doesn't care, then, you know, that hurts. Now, the answer is different. The actual answer is horror. Worse. The actual answer is God wants truth to be free no matter what. And, of course, we couldn't exist if he didn't. And the basic promise is that, yeah, you're low now, but that's not how you're going to be post-death. Of course... You know, they're just words. It's a promise, you believe it or not. And you have no idea what post-death is like until you analyze it, but that takes a long time. And, um, meanwhile, life is low and slow and nasty, brutish, and short. as Hobbes would say. So now what? If God exists, the atheist can turn around and say, it's not a very nice life. Yeah, and it gets even worse than what I've just said. It's not only not a very nice life, because you're held to his own standard even though you can't meet that standard. But when I say you're held to his standard, I don't want to put this. Even if you met the standard, you can't do anything for him. Let's say that you do what I keep arguing you got to do because otherwise this whole story is not worth going through. Just ask the ceiling God if you really exist, I need proof. Supernatural, invisible God can only prove himself supernaturally and invisibly to your soul directly. Otherwise, you shouldn't even bother with the Bible or the spiritual life or anything else. Because the spiritual life is doing that very thing for the rest of your life every single minute, ideally. You're constantly asking the ceiling, God, what should I be thinking now? What should I be doing now? Where should I go? And even if you do all that... You're not actually serving God. I mean, when you're five years old, your parents tell you, do this, Johnny, you're a good person if you do this, and you're doing this for me. That's to teach Johnny the inherent validity, the inherent value of doing certain things. So Johnny actually thinks he's serving his parents, and he's being a good boy if he does those things he's told to do. But in point of fact, doesn't actually do anything for his parents. It's doing something for Johnny. It's training him. 
by the same token, we're given a lot of commands in Scripture, and we have to live this in-your-head life 24-7, constantly monitoring our thoughts for whether we're sinning or whether we're making the right choices, right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong. <sighs> and in the language of children, in the language of accommodation, we're told that we're serving God if we do this. And so long as we remain spiritual children, we don't see what's behind the rules, even though we structure our ruling our children the same way and for the same parental reason. The children who obey us and our rules aren't given those rules really to obey us. They're given those rules so they can learn what's good for them. And it's the same thing with our Heavenly Father. But while we're spiritual children, we think, I'm doing good things for God. I'm serving God. You see the point? So it's even worse. Because you're going to go through all this much more arduous life than your typical Christian knows. And it's not doing anything for God. at all. You will never, ever, ever, from now until eternity and after eternity begins, you will never be able to do anything that's good for God. His pleasure is in you learning it for your own happiness and your own sake. But honey, when you try to do this down here, it doesn't feel good. Sometimes. There's an innate satisfaction that eventually comes from doing the right thing. There's an innate satisfaction that eventually comes from seeking the truth and learning the truth and knowing the truth. And eventually, those two satisfactions outclass all other pleasures in life. But that's eventually. That's if you do it your whole life. In the beginning, when you're young, and especially when you're in the adolescent phase of the spiritual life, it don't feel good. And that's why people peel off into the religion. They're trying to gain a compensation, a satisfaction they're not getting from trying to be good little boys and girls. It doesn't feel good. Morality doesn't feel good. It doesn't taste good to them. So they have to tell themselves that they're pleasing God, that they're serving God, that they're good boys and girls if they do that. Because they're not getting the innate compensation that eventually results. And they don't want to wait. They don't get innate compensation from contact with God because they're really not trying to learn God for himself. They're using him as a, a you know, designer label to feel good about themselves. Having a personal relationship with God is not really what they want. They just want to feel good. So either hallucinate a personal relationship with God. Oh, God spoke to me, you know, as an atheist. You surely understand that. That's your biggest complaint. So they hallucinate God's will when it's really their own. And they hallucinate serving God, doing good for God, when they're not, and can't. All because they can't, they, they won't grow up in the standards and learn to want the standards for the standards' own sake. The standard of knowing truth, the standard of wanting truth, the standard of knowing God, the standard of wanting God. The standard of, of doing the right thing just because. Just because it's intrinsically in it's intrinsically satisfying to do that. They don't grow up to get to that point where they find it intrinsically satisfying to do those things. So Christians tend to be the most miserable people on the face of the earth. And therefore irrational. So how, as a rational Christian, does one answer all of this? You see? 
The rational Christian, like the rational atheist, has to admit these are conundra. Evil exists. We are made low. Nothing we can do can benefit God. Everything we do is just Sisyphus. That's why I use that as my avatar. How does a rational Christian deal with those conundra? It looks like all God wants is to be masochistic to himself and sadistic to everybody else. Because here's this divine standard nobody can meet. And, and you know, because he's really teaching us. It's, it's a standard that he applies to us as well. And we get punished when we don't live up to it. Because he's trying to teach us to love it. Well, it's kind of hard to love it if you can't do it. And even when you do do it, however much you do it, it's not good enough, and it doesn't do anything for him. That's the truth. So why is an atheist going to want to believe in the God of the Bible? Forget all the other objections they come up with, because all those other objections can be shot down. But these, why evil? Why are we so low? We can't do anything for God. Why did he impose this on himself? And why is it that whatever we do is never enough? And how is it that we're going to love it for its own sake? Those are substantial objections that in times past and present have sent a lot of rational atheists packing. You know, they were former Christians. And of course, you know, there is another one that is equally in the same vein, but even the hardest thing to understand at all. Hi, there's this book that was written over 1500 years, okay fine, starting in 1440 BC, according to conventional scholarship, and I can prove it from scripture itself, in the actual text. Um, starting in 1440 BC, some guy named Moses started writing the Bible. A whole bunch of people after him told 44 authors over 1500 years, and it was completed around 94 AD with a uh, book of Revelation. 66 books, you can prove that they're all from God, and you can prove that they all interlink to each other because they all refer to each other. And therefore, you can determine that the other books that claim to be from God do not. Okay, fine, we get past that hurdle, which is sizable. But here's the ultimate statement that many atheists make. You expect me to believe that this old book tells me that some guy I never met 2,000 years ago hung on a cross and all the sins of human history were somehow magically imputed. Okay, fine. It was a miracle. By miracle imputed to him on the cross in three hours. And somehow, that action is going to pay for all those sins so that even an axe murderer can just believe this guy did that. And even the axe murderer gets to be in heaven forever, whereas the guy who worked his buns off and totally gave the charity and gave everything up all of his life but never did believe in this mythical or real person who did this mythical or real thing 2,000 years ago, the guy who didn't believe that, no matter how good he is, goes to hell forever? Is that a rational claim? You can understand why people say no to it. As a rational Christian, you have to answer that most of all. And you know what? Now do you see, you know, I'd spent time saying that the rational atheists are few. And over 90% of the atheists who call themselves atheists are irrational. Okay, but you see how hard it is to be a rational atheist when you got those four immaterialities? Great. On the flip side... Look how hard it is to be a rational Christian. You see why so many Christians argue other things to try to explain away these problems? 
most of Christianity adds stuff. I mean, the real gospel in the Bible is just believe Jesus Christ paid for your sins. And in that instant, you you first do that, you're forever saved. Okay, but 99% of Christianity doesn't can't even say that gospel correctly. It's appalling. Maybe it's 90%. We'll say 90%. I mean, I didn't even see... One out of 12 websites even got part of the idea correct that I was examining. I'm not even sure it's that, that common. One-twelfth is like 8% of Christianity getting it right. I'm not even sure it's that high. Because everybody's adding things like, oh, well, you also have to believe he rose from the dead. No. You also have to believe that he's God. No. You also have to repent of your sins. No. You see the point? Christians have trouble with this. That's just about the cross alone, let alone why evil. And they just fall all over themselves saying, well, God really didn't cause the evil. Ultimately, yeah, he did. If he knew going in that evil would result and he didn't stop it, that makes him an accessory. In any court of law, anywhere in the world, if you know of a crime beforehand, or you know the, of you know the cause of a crime, or you know the people involved in a crime, or anything else associated with that crime, and you don't do something to either prevent it or pronounce upon it, you can actually go to jail in most countries of the world as an accessory to the crime. So isn't God an accessory? And why did he impose standards on us that are impossible to fulfill? So that we're constantly spending our lives trying to obey this standard we can't live up to. And it never feels good, and there's never any compensation for it. You see why the atheist is an atheist. You see why Christians have to try to explain all this stuff away to even feel comfortable being Christians. And frankly, this is why Christians stop being Christians. This is why so many deconversions happen. I mean, usually they happen for lesser causes. But this is a pretty powerful reason. And, it's, and how do you defend it? You can't really defend it without violating scripture. You just have to admit, you know what, this is really a problem. Just like the rational atheist has to admit there are at least four immaterialities he cannot explain. We have to admit that these problems really exist in scripture. And really it boils down to the same kind of answer that the rational atheist has to make. There is something unknown that resolves it. In our case, we have to say that God loves justice. I believe him. He wouldn't have made me if he didn't love me because what other reason could there be? I can't do anything for him. See, you can take the premise, being so bad, warranting disbelief, and say, well, it's because the premise is as bad as it is that it warrants belief. Because surely it does. What can I do for God? Absolutely nothing. So did he make me knowing all the stupidity I'd be going in? Yeah. Okay, well then he must love me anyhow. Has nothing to do with me deserving it. It just has to do with his choice. And can he change his mind tomorrow and, you know, make rape a good thing? Yeah. But obviously he's not going to. Okay, but then why does he allow rape? See? Why does he allow the Holocaust? And the answer in the Bible is, I'm going to make good on everything that goes wrong. And the first answer back to that is, well, if something's wrong, isn't it wrong in God's face first? Isn't the cross forever in his face? If ever anything was unjust, that sure is. And he says he's going to make good on it? It cost him. He basically paid for me twice first pays for me to, to create me and sustain my breath and you know make sure I have food and lodging and clothing however much or however little 
And then he has to go to the cross and pay for me also? I believe him. And then the atheist turns around and says, rightly so, uh, hello, this is in an old book that was written, you know, years and years and years and years ago, and you never met this person. You bet. All that's true. Not denying it. That's why I close by saying the only reason it could possibly be worth your time to even investigate these outrageous and on the surface at least um, evil, bad things is if you first know God exists and which God he is. So again, we go back to the beginning. The rational Christian will have first asked the ceiling. God, you know, this is a real thorny issue. If you really exist, I need proof. Otherwise, I'm going to be wasting my time on this Bible life thing. I'm going to be spinning my wheels on all these ideas about you. And until I know which one, which God you are, it's not worth your time or mine if you really exist. It's not worth my time to go running around with this Bible thing until I know for sure you're that God. If there is any God up there, I need proof that which God you are too. And that's why I said, Proving God, the video there, ask the ceiling, read the Bible, ask the ceiling about what you're reading and keep on doing it for 30 days at least 15-30 minutes a day because until you've got proof there's no reason to be anything but a rational atheist peace out